Thank you so much. Today, we are discussing with you the artificial intelligence. We have been discussing the same topic since the beginning of the day, I think. And not only since the beginning of the day, but even since the last few years. And every day, there are new challenges, new innovation, new idea that is helping education to change, grow, and sustain. But by the end, and I think, you know, all of us, we agree together that the most important thing for us is our learners and how we are making sure to motivate them and be able to use the artificial intelligence in the real world. So we will start, first of all, by thinking all of us together how the artificial intelligence will serve our transformational educational approach how it will be a tool to improve digital literacy, how it will be a way of creating more collaboration between teachers, creating system that could communicate and talk to each other. And during that session, we will be more than welcome to have all your questions whenever you need to clarify or highlight any idea. And even after the session, we are more than welcome to communicate with us. So allow me just to give another round of applause to all our panels here. So artificial intelligence and individualizing learning plan. This is a topic that each teacher would like to have in hand and be able to moderate and follow the progress of his students while using that. This is also the dream of every leader to be able to follow the progress of every student in his school. How artificial intelligence is helping us to drive a pace for every child and monitor his own progress, assess the progress and report it to his parents. If I'm starting by Dr. Nabil and give him the mic just to comment on that. Good afternoon, everybody. I see they put us after you ate lunch, great. I see everybody now ready for a story. So I'll try to take you back to the 50s and 60s where we introduced individualized learning at that time. And then we've talked about it in so many different names. Unfortunately, it was so tough to actually do it in practice. Then I recall we went on working on my doctorate on learning style, multiple intelligences. We went to introducing what I called then the theory of situational teaching, depending on the type of knowledge, the philosophy of education, learning styles, multiple intelligences. How do I differentiate my instruction? Then University of Virginia introduced differentiated instruction and so on. The problem at that time, we couldn't get it to work because it was very difficult to apply. Now, why, why should we change? We went from teacher-centered to student-centered to learner-centered, and now we are pushing student-driven learning. So how come that journey took us here? Well, I, I'll, I'm reminded with a story since you've been hearing a lot of technical things. It was the holidays and this lady was sitting and uh, cooking and all of them went to check what she's doing. She was taking a roast and she took the roast, cut almost a quarter of it on each end, wrapped it, put it in the oven, and they were very surprised. They asked her, how come you do that? She said, to be honest with you, I always saw mom do that. Let me call her and ask. She called mom and said, how come you've done that, mom? She said, Good news, your mom is still alive and kicking. Let me give her a call. She called grandma. Grandma said, we were so poor. We didn't have a large pot for it to fit in, so we had to cut it. And that's exactly what's been happening. We've been repeating the things again and again. It was for a good reason at that time, but no longer we can have a recipe that fits all. That's where artificial intelligence come in in order to allow us to do personalized learning. And so what does it do for us? When we've talked about data, how do we analyze data, how to triangulate data, how we can use that data, now we have that to help us. Then we've talked about collaboration, differentiation, inquiry, 
We've talked about flipped classroom. We've talked about... All back to the COVID time, and it actually still remains. That's why I'm mentioning it here. The equity hit us very badly. The digital divide hit us very, very badly uh, in India. And um, you had uh, the, the gentleman speaking uh, who was from the government sector, the IS officer. So I mean, there, the children got nothing to study with. And I think they still live with those gaps. So as much as you may try, it's very, very tough to get to grab, you know, to bridge this digital divide. So obviously, many schools did a lot. You know, I it was about giving uh, devices or whatever. But I don't think it really worked, unless and until the government steps in in a very, very large way. It's not only what he's talking about the the, the digital part, uh, the device part. It's also the internet. There were many many areas where there was just no way that people could reach out at all. So I think the government has to do a lot, and that gap has really put children back, which is so evident even today. I thought I had to mention that coming from India. Absolutely, and I think this is important as well when we are considering not only the students, but the parents' point of view of implementing artificial intelligence. And you will be surprised, for example, as leader, we were discussing all the time in schools, are we banning the mobile phone or permitting them? Yet, families are supporting, you know, the utilization of the mobile phone all the time. But when it will come to devices, they will say, oh, but we don't want to learn with devices. So how we can overcome as well that crucial approach and make everyone satisfied and ready to implement the artificial intelligence, yet continue to implement as well or utilize the term balance in life? Dr. Nabil? Uh, just want to pick up on what my colleagues said. If we look at the key point was we shouldn't lose track of some key things just because we're introducing technology. And I think my colleague introduced critical thinking and then change ready, being change ready. So I think having the skills, the values, the mechanisms, and the attitude needed for good quality teaching and learning are essential to have as foundation for anything. Because if they have these attributes, given time, even though they might be a digital divide, they can pick up a lot faster. We can easily teach somebody mechanisms, but we cannot teach them after many years of simply root learning to think. We cannot teach them all of a sudden creativity. That's a process. So we should start always with these foundations. And of course, let me tie it to the previous panel. They've talked about holistic education. And I love that holistic education and AI are at the same conference. Usually people approach them totally differently. I can tell you, and I think what's happening in the world these days, without having peace education and holistic education, I don't think the rest is very helpful. Just to, to chip into that as well, I think, you know, one of the interesting things for all of us, as we are aware, is that AI learns from interactions online. It learns from us and the way we behave. And I'd say us, but at the same time, I don't think it's really us that it's always learning from. Uh, there's a quiet voice of reason sometimes in digital spaces, whilst people with anger um, and horrible values are spouting forth. And so AI is learning from them. They're learning from the people that engage and online chats and online spaces. And I think it's really important for us to consider as a society how we shape AI, how we contribute to the values piece, the importance of EQ over IQ, and that we look for ways to shape that because we are responsible for shaping an entity that is going to input and develop so much of our future society that if we don't give thought to that, it can go in terrible spaces and terrible places that we don't really wanna see for our kids. Absolutely. And then coming back as well, you know, to our model of discussion here. As you can see, the decision of implementing artificial intelligence, either, for example, in individualized learning plans or supporting the model of learning or even providing equitable 
uh, laptops or tablets for every student is a very difficult one. Leaders are pushed some time to go towards taking decisions, but the most important thing is to have enough research backing these decisions. Because for example, during the COVID-19, all of us, we had to think quickly for a solution to make the children learn while they're not in school. And we have been proven very innovative and creative. And we differentiate these learning models according to the different needs, requirements, facilities, and resources. Yet in the same time, we cannot go back and say we will ignore totally the technology that has been in place because there are a lot of investment that has been also happening. But how to utilize all these resources will be our next steps. And I think here, if I'm going back to Amrita from a different perspective, she can give us more examples about the implementation of technology that sustain after the COVID-19. Yeah, so I, I think that's a very, very um, uh, good point because all of us were in the same boat we didn't know which way to, you know, take our classes. Just like it was mentioned in one of the panel that suddenly in Dubai, it was announced that from tomorrow, it's going to be a lockdown and no classes. It was the same in India. And we suddenly realized that tomorrow we are shut. And we all thought that, okay, we'll come back maybe in the next 20 days to realize that we were there almost for a year. So everyone was in the same boat. Everyone was very creative. Everyone invested a lot of time, effort and money. And then when we got back, uh, it, you know, I think the, the attitude was to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there was a lot of standing up against online. Oh God, I've had enough and now no more. Probably today, the challenge is the maximum in that, that I don't want to get back. But I think as all of us, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure even here, as much as it is in India, the challenge for the educators has been that there, there were some very good points about the online education that we had. How do we still maintain that and keep that blend beautifully going between the traditional and the, uh, the online? And uh, so we realized that, you know, I don't want to go ahead with every point. We spoke about personalization, the flexibility and uh, individualization of uh, studies. And I think more than anything else, the communication, the globe really shrinking, all that were great points about the online. So I personally also in my institution, we've been struggling because parents have been coming back and saying, look, I just don't want online. But then we have kept the online going. The traditional has got its advantages. But how we marry the two? Are we really training our teachers on this marriage? I think is the biggest challenge today. Because how do I manage to do certain things online? And how do I mix it or blend it with my traditional? Is probably the biggest challenge for the schools. How do I manage to get my parents on board. Children are happy doing online, but the parents are not. So uh, this, I think the training of the teachers to get this into the system has been the biggest challenge. And I think we've been doing that uh, pretty well. Thank you so much. Anyone would like to comment on this point? Well, actually to follow up on that, just briefly, um, uh, training the teachers um, is always like, uh, for me, a bit of a catch-22. Um, teachers always want more training. And then, if I'm the presenter up here, and you're all the teachers in my school, how many of you are on your laptops and on your phones not paying attention to me while I'm supposed to be doing the PD for you? So we have to morph it more into a hybrid training, to use that word, that lovely word, hybrid education, hybrid PD. Here's what we're going to be doing. There are ways you can learn it on your own. There's ways you can sign up for the training, but you don't have to be there if you can do it on your own. Mm -hmm. And teachers, schools need to figure that out. But as administrators and principals and heads and superintendents, our owners and our boards are always obsessed with, did everyone do it the same way? Which is counter to what hybrid and people learning on their own is supposed to be about. So that's something we have to remember too, that 
maybe I defend teachers too much, but they have a harder job than we do mm -hmm. in the front office. We clean up after them sometimes with an angry parent, but they've got the hard job. And if you think the teacher's job's not hard, don't go down to kindergarten because they get a lot of outside time. Go down to first grade and take their place for a day. All right, go ahead. Go down to first grade and do it, administrators. And then you, the empathy needs to be there. So, but how we train those teachers or how we permit them to navigate this AI world that's layered on top of everything now is, is the crux of the matter, for me anyway. Definitely, and one example, for example, that we have kept as well all the time from uh, you know, the time of COVID is the parents-teacher conferences. We continue doing it physically and online based on, first of all, the teacher's needs and time, because yes, we have to take that in consideration. They cannot spend hours till midnight doing meetings while they have also kids at home. So there is a specific time where they are in school physically for parents who would like to have parents-teacher conferences physically. And there are also opportunity for online parents-teacher conferences where we have a system they can book you know, the, the appointment, get the appropriate appointment even after working hours. And it is working, you know, it's a win-win for both parents and teachers. So there are very good examples that could continue and could sustain after, of course, the COVID-19 and could continue working. Yes, doctor. Just I want to say, like anything else, we have all know that change is the only constant. And we all have seen that happening time and time again. And the main thing that allows change to happen successfully is in your school, in your college, at university, wherever you're at, you need to have leadership density. You need to ensure that every person in your school, from the teacher to the staff member, is a leader, can take initiative, they're empowered, they listen to. You introduce voice and choice to them just like you do for student and student-driven learning. Without them being empowered and being part of the decision-making, always there will be a lot of barriers to successful change. Thank you so much. One thing that you would like to share with all participants as a tip to take off from our discussion, we'll start with Glenn. No, I just think it's really important, as I said before, that we carefully examine next steps, uh, whether it's a piece of technology that we're looking to introduce, whether it's changing a format or process and the way in which we interact with students or teachers, um, teachers to students, whether we're uh, changing the way our students create, develop, um, exercise their thinking, that there's a, a long dialogue and examination process about that, that we're not too quick to change, because we have to get it right. And if we're too quick to change, we're experimenting on people who don't deserve um, the situation where we don't know what we're doing, but we're telling them what to do. And so I think we need to be careful of that, and that's something that I would encourage each school to do. There's different fits for every situation. As you said before, there's digital divides. There's spaces where people are ready. There's a lot of opportunity where the values of a particular community will support certain changes at a different speed to others. So it's not about one fit for all, but it is about making sure that we have carefully considered conversations that explore the next step in order to get the right next step. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Nabil? Just a final thought. You know, whatever you do, it's not the recipe. When I thought what I'm gonna say here, I went, who I'm gonna ask about AI, I ask AI. It gave me 28 answers to what I should say. And, and I want to remind you, when you go to somebody and then you're sitting there for dinner again. I started with dinner, I'm going to end with dinner. And you love what you eat. And then you ask for that recipe. You take that recipe, you go home, you try it. Doesn't taste the same. You have the exact measures. You put this, you put you. Why didn't it taste the same? Because... The environment where you had it was different. The little flavor that been added, the pitch of salt, little tenderness, little empathy, the care, the passion it was given, that's what makes the difference. So yes, AI will give us a recipe, but we should never lose the importance of 
the human being. So yes, AI is important, but HI, the human intelligence, and the human emotional intelligence are must be their part of that equation. Thank you so much. We will definitely could continue for hours, but we know that we have also other panels after us. We would like to allow the time for any question that we may come to us that will inspire as well the conversation. Yes, please. I want to start by thanking our lovely panelists, very insightful. And I also want to introduce myself. My name is Bassem Abu Daga. So I do a little bit of advisory and investments in the educational space and the ed tech space. So it's a bit funny because I want to address the elephant in the room. We're talking about um, using technology, but we're really talking about the fringes of technology. We're not really addressing the core of sol solving a, an educational system that's been so outdated now that it really needs to move to the next level. Let me ask a question to everybody. Have you heard the, the term bells and cells before? Bells and cells. Well, you'll never forget this after this because that's what the students are going through. They go to the school, they sit in this class or the cell, then the bell rings, and then the next professor or teacher comes in and then the bell rings after 45 minutes. That's exactly like jail, that's what they're in. They're in jail time, and it's from one professor, one teacher to the other, and that's how archaic the educational system seems to be. So the reason why I bring this up is because it'll be lovely to see if you can use technology to inspire a 12-year-old student to walk through school knowing what his obligations are on the academic front, knowing that they have to meet a specific requirement to meet whatever standard that needs to get him to some university, and at the same time, enjoy what his passion is. So in a day that he thinks he excels in chemistry or she, does not mean they need to sit through 45 minutes or 50 minutes of even differentiated learning within the chemistry class. And the same crosses. So in that space where they perfected chemistry, if they're a professional or if they're passionate about violin or art or sports or anything like that. That's what they should be doing because that's really what differentiated learning is supposed to be or individualized learning plans. Every student should be able to do what they love, kind of like what they do in university or kind of what they do in life. So I'm kind of very curious to see if anyone's interested in a conversation like that. We'd love to carry yeah, on. Absolutely, uh, I, normally, and before giving the microphone to all other panelists as well, the current schools now are doing that. I have one student who is a hero in horse riding and he's coming because he has a total different timetable and he is eager to come to school every day. He was one of our, you know, let's say, you know, low achiever student until we tailored for him that individualized learning plan. I have another student who is very talented in art, but in the same time, not having the same passion, for example, for physics. So we also draft for him these kinds of individualized learning plan. And this is where our conversation starts, but we said that we don't want to move very fast in the individualized learning plan without having the consistency across. So hopefully, Jeff will, will add more, sorry, Jim will add more to the, our conversation. I'm glad you brought up the elephant in the room because the pushback is if you've got a thousand 12, 13, 14 year old boys in a building, that's like having a thousand elephants in the building, okay? Um, so I appreciate that the ed tech world at times says things like cells and bells and it's great, I'm never gonna forget it. But please manage a space that's filled with rooms and hallways and corridors and stairwells and outside areas of a thousand middle school boys that can come and go and do what they please from eight till three. Because not a single parent in the room of a middle school boy here wants to know they're going to school and the principal and the teachers don't know where they are every moment. Okay, so it's a, it's a yin and yang thing. I, I'm glad you brought up about um, students in your school within, and we're getting to that, but we did some of those things before AI. 
with individual plans for different learners and who had special needs when it came to sports or activities or things like that. The real gist of it is how is the ed tech, how are the ed tech people gonna make it easier for us to use their products to scale? Because you've got lots of products to scale to sell to us, but you gotta make it easy enough that it becomes simple, like turn a light switch on and off electricity. RIT still doesn't work that easy every time. We still wonder when our computer reboots, is it really gonna reopen everything that's shut down? Uh, you don't worry that much with a book and with turn the light switch on and off. So the ed tech sphere has to make it real easy for those thousand boys in that school to be managed safe, safely and also have those individual plans. So we're waiting on you guys, okay? Just one point, yeah, quickly. So I think uh, the bell cell really doesn't work anymore, I think, in most of the progressive schools at all. In fact, if you want your kids back in school, the cells have to be all off now. And I think it's the ed tech that we've all been speaking about, which is making it possible, this blended format. In fact, there are so, so many schools, I don't want to, uh, sorry, children in my school who barely come to school because they are into other kind of, you know, interests. And it is the, it's the technology that supports them. So bell cell doesn't work at all. If you want your kids back in school, you just have to get out of that. Thank you so much. Any other questions? So thank you so much for listening to us. We have been delighted to talk to you today. And we know that there are other members waiting for us. So a huge thank you to all our collaborators who have been you know, inspiring all of you in the session and looking forward to see you in different contexts. Thank you so much.